The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home with his disciples, and such a crowd collected that they could not even have a meal. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to take charge of him, convinced he was out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying, Beelzebul is in him, and it is through the prince of devils that he cast devils out. So he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot last. And if a household is divided against itself, that household can never stand. Now if Satan has rebelled against himself and is divided, he cannot stand either. It is the end of him. But no one can make his way into a strong man's house and burgle his property unless he has tied up the strong man first. Only then can he burgle his house. I tell you solemnly, all men's sins will be forgiven and all their blasphemies. But let anyone blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and he will never have forgiveness. He is guilty of an eternal sin. This was because they were saying an unclean spirit is in him. His mother and brothers now arrived and standing outside, sent in a message asking for him. A crowd was sitting round him at the time the message was passed to him. Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. He replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking round at those sitting in a circle about him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So today we have a very interesting story that we read in the gospel. And there are actually two different things that we might want to reflect upon. If you notice, the story today started, the first paragraph, it started telling us Jesus went home with his disciples. Yeah? He was so busy, he couldn't even have a meal. And how the relatives think he is out of his mind and they are coming to take charge of him. And at the end of today's gospel, we see finally they arrive and there is this little um, dialogue that Jesus has with those who are around him, telling them that they are his mother and brothers, those who are sitting around him, you know, in a circle, anyone who does the will of God. Okay, so we have that. So it's like a sandwich. The beginning and the end is about Jesus and this thing about doing the will of God to be part of God's family. Now in the middle, there is this whole episode about the scribes, right? Accusing Jesus of casting out the devil with the prince of the devils, okay? And this is where Jesus, he talks about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, about the so-called eternal sin that cannot be forgiven. Yeah? And this was in response to the attitude and the action of the scribes. Okay, so the attitude and actions of the scribes who were accusing Jesus of something that was not true. And in fact, they knew it was not true. Okay? So, first thing we want to reflect on is this whole episode. We'll come back to the family after this. Okay? Now, I want to ask you all a question. Is there a limit to God's mercy? 
No, okay, wow, okay. I, I didn't get a chance to ask those who are saying yes, you can put up your hand. Those who are saying no, you can put up your hand. All right, resounding no. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. And in fact, yes, you know, this is what we believe. There is no limit to God's mercy. Now, explain to me how come there is this sin that cannot be forgiven? The so called eternal sin. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Okay, don't worry. Nobody's going to come up and explain, right? <laughs> okay. So, it is true, in fact, that there is such a sin, this sin against the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us so, the so-called eternal sin. And yet, we do not consider this as a limitation of God's mercy. So, let me explain. What actually is this sin or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven? All right, okay, no need for me to explain. Let the Catechism of the Catholic Church explain to all of us. You all know the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is the official teaching of our church. Okay, so it's not an opinion of Father. Huh? It's official teaching. From the pulpit, we teach the official teaching of the church. Remember that. Yeah, not our personal opinions. So, Catechism, the Catholic Church, 1864. Okay, I'll repeat one more time. 1864. You can Google it. CCC 1864. You will see the teaching of the church. The 1864, not for you to go and buy Toto after this Mass. Okay, I know some people who do that. <laughs> All right. And let me read it to you in case you have no time to go and Google it. It says very clearly, there are no limits to the mercy of God. So you were right, huh? All of you said, yeah, there's no limit. Correct. There are no limits to the mercy of God, but, there's a but, huh? but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy huh, deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting, rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. So such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. Okay, end of quote. So that was the quotation from CCC 186. Four. Again, reminder, not for buying Toto, go and check 1864, Google CCC and reflect on it. Yes, there's no limit to the mercy of God, but this so-called sin against the Holy Spirit, what is it? It is when we ourselves reject God's mercy. We ourselves say, no, I don't want to be forgiven. Or maybe, no, I don't think I can be forgiven. Or maybe we might say, no, I did not sin, even though I did. And therefore, I don't want to say sorry for it. These are all examples of how we can reject the mercy of God. Okay, so now, according to the Catechism of St. Pius X, the so old Catechism, what are these sins against the Holy Spirit? There are six. So the first one is despairing on being saved. That's when you say, I am beyond salvation. Nobody can save me. I don't think God even can save me. And there are people who despair. So they close the door of their heart to God because of despair. So maybe not so many fall in this category, but you will find there's some fall into this trap. There is nobody beyond redemption. And God wants to save everyone. The second one is called presuming on being saved. This is the opposite. This is no matter what, I'm surely going to be saved. So some have this presumption. And when they have that presumption, they are not going to be sorry for any sins they did. They'll just say, Jesus died on the cross, therefore no matter what I do, I'm going to be saved. This is a presumption which leads us to not acknowledging our sins, and not asking God for forgiveness for them and not doing penance for them. Okay, the third example given of a sin against the Holy Spirit, opposing the known truth. 
Okay, now this is probably what the scribes were doing. They knew, they are not stupid. Satan cannot cast out Satan. A house divided against itself cannot. They knew it. They are not foolish people. The scribes are very wise, intelligent fellows. But they were just deliberately going against Jesus. That is why they fell into this category. Hmm? So when you oppose the truth that you know actually, but just because you have hardened your heart. Fourth example is envying another person's graces. Uh, this one might be a bit surprising. When we envy the grace of another person, what happens is we are focusing out there on the other person and we are not examining our own self. You don't examine ourselves. You don't appreciate yourself for what you are. You don't acknowledge your strengths, your gifts. Likewise, don't acknowledge your weakness and your failures. You are not going to be able to enter into an authentic relationship with God. And that also will prevent you from receiving His mercy. Okay? So that's a tricky one. Envying others' graces. The fifth one, obstinately remaining in sin. You know what you're doing is wrong, and yet you remain obstinate about it. So this is a very clear rejection of following God. You reject God and you remain obstinate. So it's not that God doesn't want you to return. You say, no, I don't want to return. Being obstinate in your sin. And that leads to the sixth example cited by the Catechism of Pius X, and that is the so-called final impenitence. That means right up to your last dying breath, you refuse to repent for your sins. And though God is there waiting to give you the forgiveness that you need and to welcome you into eternal life, even at that last breath, you still keep the door closed and say, God, I don't want you in my life and I do not ever want you in my life. I am not sorry for the sins I have done. You do not exist even. Final impenitence. Uh, that is, of course, the worst. Lah. So it's not that God does not want to forgive, but God again is shut out. So my dear brothers and sisters, with that example, do we now understand what is this sin against the Holy Spirit? Very clear? Okay, so good. We have this teaching of the church. And yes, always keep it in your mind. There is no limit to God's mercy. But we are free to reject that mercy. However, we must pay the consequences of our free choice to reject His mercy and love. Okay, so that's the first part of the homily today. We have reflected on that whole middle section of the gospel. Now we come back to the family of Jesus. Okay, it's another thing altogether. And we want to reflect upon what Jesus said. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother. This statement actually applies first and foremost to Jesus himself. He was doing the will of the Father. And everyone thought, this fellow is out of his mind. Okay, so this statement, it applies first of all to Jesus. He is the one who is doing the will of God. Yes, going around, preaching, healing, no time even to rest, no time even to eat, being pursued by the crowds day and night. And his family and relatives thought he is out of his mind. But actually, he was very, very lucid. He knew what he was doing. And what was it that he was doing? The will of God. So he was in the right place at the right time doing what God wanted him to do by his free choice. Okay, I add that in at the end. In case any of us have a deterministic or fatalistic idea of God's will. Okay, deterministic, fatalistic idea of God's will is that God, for example, uh, we might think, oh, God has already decided what is going to happen tomorrow in my life. If you ever have that kind of thought in your mind, then know that you are misunderstanding this idea of following the will of God. 
Do anyone have this in their mind? God has already decided who is the person I'm going to marry. God has already decided I'm going to die whether of cancer or of a heart attack. God has already decided the time and the place this and that is going to happen. Oh, be careful. Huh? That is a deterministic, fatalistic idea of God's will, which we reject. Yeah, don't fall into that. And you know, because some people think that we Christians believe in the will of God in this sense, they say, in that case, I'm only like a pawn on a chessboard and God is just moving me where he wants. Where is my freedom? Where is my choice? And therefore they say, better I reject God. So this wrong idea of God's will has in fact led many to reject God. Especially when bad things happen in our life, and we will say, God, why did you decide that this thing should happen in my life? What did I do so bad that I should be punished now in this way? Why did you choose me to go through this? Especially when the bad things are happening. Ah, that is when we will start to harden our heart against God and we will start even to curse God, bringing us back to the blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. So very careful eh, when we talk about will of God. Not in this kind of deterministic, fatalistic sense. As though what is going to happen at the very next moment, God has already decided and we just have to go through it. Okay? No. Where then is our freedom? Where then is our choice? Do you understand? So, when we say God's will, what are we talking about? God's will that has been revealed to us in the Bible, in the Word of God. He tells us, love one another as I have loved you. Yes, that is what God wants you and me to do. But He's not going to tell you, love one another in this particular way that I have decided you are going to love and that particular person whom I want you to marry. Not in that sense. But if you are a married person, then love your spouse according to the teaching of Christ. That is God's will for you. It's just one example. So, you know, interestingly enough, when this uh, sentence appears in the Gospel of Luke, this we read today from the Gospel of Mark. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus does not say, here are my brothers and my mother and my sisters, anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother. In Luke, he will say, anyone who hears the word of God and does it. That person is my mother, my brother, and my sister. Okay, if you go and check Gospel of Luke. Father is not bluffing you, go and check. Today we read Mark. If you read Gospel of Luke, Jesus will say, anyone who hears the word of God and does it. This is the kind of will of God that we are talking about. Yes, allowing God to guide us in our life being prompted by the Holy Spirit, living according to the teachings of Jesus. That is God's will for us. And we do this with the fullness of the gift of freedom that God has given to each one of us. We do this with the fullness of the creativity that God has given to each one of us. Never in a deterministic, fatalistic, passive manner. We are actors, free actors. And the script writer is ourselves, because God has so ordained that we should be free. Okay, I think this point, I've gotten over this point to you, right? And very important. So now when anything bad happens in anybody's life, be very careful. Don't say things like, Oh, this is God's will for you. You have to just accept it. You know how painful that is for somebody who is going through some kind of suffering. You make it almost as, as though they have no choice at all in this matter or whatever it is. And it's really, it, it's a blasphemy against God actually. And you will make that person hate God. So be careful. Catholics like to say this. Pious people like to say, you know, it's, oh, that's God's time. Oh, this is God's will. So, just submit and accept. Be a good boy. God wants to whack you now, let him whack you. After that, 
He'll give you some sweets because you submitted to him. This is not Christianity. This is a barbaric kind of religion. And it is this kind of barbaric religiosity that people are rejecting. And they say, we don't want religion. We don't want Christianity. We don't want God. Actually, they don't want this rubbish nonsense that even a good Christian may be telling to them, oh, this is God's will for you. Just accept it. Be humble. God is greater. We are the ones sometimes causing people to blaspheme against God. Okay. Now, I think there was a third point, but I've actually forgotten what it is. Oh. <laughs> okay, never mind. I think the Holy Spirit is telling me, okay, enough, enough, enough. They heard enough already. They got the point. And they have a lot to reflect on. Leave them be. And let us continue with our thanksgiving to God. Let us continue worshipping God in the Eucharist. And allowing ourselves to be filled with the love of God and enjoying the gift of freedom and trusting always in His mercy.